it's, it's, it's fairly routine now for me anyway. Um, and, uh, and this is something that I have no problem requiring my students uh, uh, to do, but uh, I'm, I'm not so, so sure I want, would want to require my colleagues uh, to do this because um, it, eh, it, gets, it gets hairy. So, um, so again, I'm, I'm gonna stay with the, the same problem format that we had earlier. And the first thing I wanna show you is how to write this algorithm as a fixed point iteration, because that's the first trick. That's the first thing you have to be able to do in order to apply uh, my style of analysis. Um, and like I said, I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting pretty good at this. So, uh, oh, actually, um, I want to open this. I'm going to stop sharing, because I want to open this in my um, uh, whatever format that I can write on. So let me just a moment here. I'm going to open this with my journal. Here we go. All right. I'm going to move this down to. It looks like you should um, have the new computer. Yes. Uh, okay. Now I need to show where is it? I want that. Uh, tutorial journal. This is the one. Okay. <clears throat> so um, you should be able to see my writing on the screen now. Um, so here's here's the 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 way Mark and Shalom write the algorithm. And now I've left myself some some blank space to uh, show you how I do this. Um, how I rewrite this as a fixed point iteration. So. We've got this xk. This is in the argmin, so it's a prox, right? So I'm going to write that prox explicitly. Uh, argmin uh, unconstrained, so of f of x plus now the x gradient of the coupling function, uh, linearized. So we're going to linearize this at the previous point. Uh, x minus x k minus one. Now plus, uh, and I'm just taking the upper bound on all these Lipschitz constants L of the Bregman divergence with potential h evaluated at x and x k minus one. So that's, that is what this Bregman prox is right here. I've started with that and I'm just writing that explicitly. And instead of the LK, I've got L bar here. Okay, that's, that's what this is. And that is then equal to this argument with respect to x. of, now I'm going to write out explicitly this term here. This is all right. And now plus L bar uh, H of X minus h evaluated at xk minus one, minus then the inner product of the gradient of h at xk minus one, x minus xk minus one. Okay, that argument. <clears throat> all right, and now I'm just rewriting all of these things. And oh, and here, so let's see. Uh, I'm gonna, what am I gonna do next? Can I skip this? Okay, well, okay, I'll, 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 I'm gonna collect this over with that term. Okay, so 
this is going to give me this. And I'll just write this q k minus one. Uh, and then minus now. All right. Minus L bar gradient of H X K minus one X. I'm going to get rid of all the constant terms because those those don't matter. Uh, now plus L bar H of X. Right, <clears throat> and this then is, uh, now I'm gonna collect terms and I can write, so um, I've got this and this. Uh, and so for the H, uh, H being this thing, this phi of X. Now, why can I write H this way? One over two beta X, squared, okay? Why can I write H that way? Because the one of the key assumptions on H was that it's strongly convex with some parameter beta involved in there. Any strongly convex function can be written like this for whatever that, that phi is then. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just, I'm pulling apart this h function and, and uh, then going to get argument with respect to x of f of x now plus l bar phi of x plus l bar over 2 beta x squared and then plus the linear term. Um, and this is my f phi. Um, but uh, let's see here. Um, now I'm going to, I've got a square here. Notice. I've got an inner product of something against X, of this thing against X. And so I'm gonna complete the square now at this point. So, and this part is my F phi. So this is the same as uh, F phi of X. Now, plus when I complete that square, I've got a constant out front, two beta, times the norm squared of x minus beta over L bar times L bar gradient of h at x k minus one minus the x gradient of q at k minus one. All right norm squared. Okay, <clears throat> and now um, that is, now look at this. Uh, that's just a point. And this I've, then I've rewritten this argument as a prox. This is the prox With respect to this function, f phi. Now, step length, L bar over beta of, now the point is, uh, I'm gonna, when I, let's see, uh, where is the x k minus one coming from? Ah, there's a, I'm missing a term, sorry. Then this norm squared, I forgot. I should have a plus, L bar over beta 
x k minus one <clears throat> in there. And so this is just the prox of that point, x k minus one minus theta over L bar times the x gradient of q k minus one uh, minus L bar gradient of phi. Uh, it turns out that uh, I can write that in terms of a gradient of phi evaluated at x k minus one. So that's my, I'm gonna trace this back up. That's my, uh, my xk, my next iterative, written as just a now a prox of a fixed function f phi with a step length l bar over beta. And then the inner thing, that's, that's my sort of, that's coming from my y block. Um, so I can write this as just like that. And the y block is now uh, this this thing. You see all these uh, all these terms coming in because because the q q k minus one. Let's go back up. Uh, now I'm going to rewrite this y explicitly in terms of the update in terms of q x k. So I just put that explicitly in to this uh, this coupling function. Uh, and that gives me this representation. And now I have no more dependence on the iterate counter K for that. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the first trick, just rewriting this as a fixed point iteration. Um, and once that's done, now I have to show that this is alpha almost, alpha firmly com whatever, uh, um, alpha firmly non expansive, right? Because this is so the two properties that yield local quantitative convergence are this almost alpha firm non expansiveness and metrics of regularity. I'm just going to focus on this. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what again is alpha firm non-expansiveness? Uh, any mapping. So we take a, a subset and, and we'll just, we'll be on our end here. Um, uh, the mapping is pointwise, almost alpha firmly non-expansive at some point y in this subset D on D whenever this uh, inequality two holds. So whenever there exists a constant alpha between zero and one and a, a constant epsilon between zero and one such that this inequality holds. Now, if you just ignore this part, again, this is just um, Lipschitz, pointwise Lipschitz continuity of T with constant one plus epsilon. And why is it pointwise Lipschitz continuity? Because only X is varying in D. The Y is fixed, okay? That would be non-expansiveness uh, with some, of what I call almost non-expansiveness because of the epsilon here. Now this, this psi, what is this? This is what I'm calling nowadays, since I've been working in nonlinear spaces, I'm calling this the transport discrepancy. And what it looks at is the difference between the residuals of the image of X under T and the image of Y under T. And just looking at that, the difference of those residuals. So I call this a transport discrepancy because I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking in terms of T is transporting X to X plus and T transports another point Y to Y plus and the discrepancy between those two residuals. Um, and, and it turns out, uh, as I've been working on this, I've been developing this now since 2015, really, um, it's, it's turning out that this is the key object, T. 
to everything, in fact. And, and particularly when you go to nonlinear spaces where you don't have addition, if we're in nonlinear spaces, it doesn't have this representation. But um, this is the key thing. Um, so, so how do now to verify to verify alpha firm non expansiveness? We need different characterizations of this um, because my my operator T is is very complicated and it's built from prox operators and gradients and and all of this. So I need to be able to to put all that together in some fashion. Um, and so some of, some of the useful characterizations of, of uh, point-wise all, uh, almost alpha firm non-expansiveness are the following. So you can describe it, you can, in a Hilbert space setting, you can pull apart the, the norm and write things in terms of an inner product, which is sometimes convenient. Um, and if you look at this, it's kind of, the, the usual monotonicity type of um, formulation of things, which I'll come to it in the next, the third characterization. This is, is precisely the uh, type of monotonicity that I was requiring of the subdifferential of F phi. Um, and you notice that each of these, these terms here this, these are less than zero, so, so and we've got this inner product. And so I say that T is pointwise almost alpha firmly non-expansive if the function F, which has T as F's resolvent. So in this case, it would be the subdifferential of, uh, of some function I'm trying to minimize. If that F satisfies this kind of monotonicity, which I call, um, let's see, uh, which I call um, type one non-monotonicity. And um, type one non-monotonicity of F. Um, and so let's look at examples so we can get a feeling for this. Suppose T is a prox operator or a resolvent, a resolvent of a, of a prox regular function. So F is prox regular with modulus tau. And if you're familiar with prox regular functions, a prox, a function is prox, if a function is prox regular, then its subdifferential satisfies this inequality. This is called submonotonicity. And you see uh, Polycan and Rockefeller. Uh, 1996, I believe, where they explore this. Um, so we'll start from that. And what I'm gonna show is that if you've got a prox regular function and you're looking at the resolvent of a prox regular function, then this, um, characterization three is satisfied, which means that the resolvent of a prox regular function is almost alpha firmly non-expansive. And, and then with, with constant, with the violation in almost alpha firm non-expansiveness related to the modulus of, of oh, this is not submonotonicity, sorry, hypomonotonicity, hypo. Modulus of hypomonotonicity. Submonotonicity, that terminology has already been taken by Aristanolidis, I think, uh, in another context. Um, so anyway, so let's start with hypomonotonicity of the subdifferential, which is coming from prox regularity of the function. And then that implies, if, if this is less than that, then I'm going to add something to that and hit it with a negative number so that this is even less than that. So that's true, where now the tau I'm going to write the tau in terms of some epsilon, right? And then the epsilon, I just rearrange this, uh, this inequality to get uh, this inequality down here. And that is the third characterization uh, of now the subdifferential satisfying this. 
And now we've, I've got this in terms of a lambda. Uh, let's see, this is in terms of a lambda up here where the lambda is, is exactly equal to one half. And this holds for all lambda. And if lambda, oh, sorry, that lambda should be one. Make lambda equal, so that should be alpha. If alpha is one half here, then uh, lambda is anywhere from zero to one, right? One half there. And so then uh, this term, lambda goes to one, this term disappears and you just get, um, and then this term is just, you just get epsilon over two lambda. So that's this, it sort of pulls apart into that. Uh, and then that's equivalent. I'm just re rewriting it in equivalent ways just to show you then that that leads to the conclusion that the resolvent is alpha firmly non-expansive with alpha equal to one half in violation epsilon where that epsilon is coming from the modulus of hypomonotonicity of the subdifferential through this. Everything kind of connected that way. All right. So, and, and actually this calculation then shows that prox regularity um, is, uh, is a special case, a stronger type of regularity than uh, almost alpha firm non-expansiveness that I'm using. So it, prox regularity implies hypomonotonicity, which implies this third characterization of, of um, alpha firm non almost alpha firm non-expansiveness. So, and, and again, I call this type one non-monotonicity in the paper with, with, um, uh, um, with Matt and Tao. Oh, I also have to do a mea culpa here. In this paper, um, the ordering of the authors is, uh, it's Luke, Tao, Tam, but this was because I was, I had put in Tao's last name as Ren, and so then N comes before T, and so, and then, but then, Tao told me that he's publishing with Tao as his last name, and I didn't then correct the ordering. So don't read anything into the ordering of the paper. We're all contributing to this, um, and the ordering of the authors. Um, so another example, steepest descent, because this is going to be key for the, the other crazy looking um, uh, mapping that we had. So let's take a function with calm gradient. All that means is one-sided Lipschitz con continuity with constant L on some neighborhood, local. Uh, we're also gonna assume that the gradient is pointwise hypomonotone. So this applies to approximate regular functions. Uh, so then we have, we have this, it's differentiable. Um, so uh, now I have a choice. I'm looking at this steepest descent mapping and I have a choice of the step length. And I'm gonna take the step length to be, I don't know why it was beta over two, but the, the, the point being that um, it's this, I'm scaling everything. Uh, mm, don't know why I kept that that way, but the, the beta comes in elsewhere. So I did this. Um, this is pointwise almost averaged. Now notice I'm, I'm not supposing that F is convex. It's just sort of calm, okay? Um, and hypo and prox regular, uh, then it's it's pointwise almost averaged with constant alpha one half and the violation here. The violation is going to depend on the step length. The larger beta, the larger the the violation, and how large it gets kind of depends is kind of coupled with the the modulus of hypo monotonicity of the gradient and also this Lipschitz constant. Uh, for the one-sided, for the calmness uh, property. Um, and then if I don't like a violation, uh, that says if I take a step size small enough, I can make this violation as small as I need it to be. So, uh, but if I have a, a, a nicer property, if F is pointwise strongly monotone, so this tau is, is actually, then we actually have this thing being bounded away from zero um, and it's positive, um, then for any step length, then I can get rid of this, 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 um, uh, uh, this just kind of shows the dependence of the step length on, 
on this, this constant tau and the, and the Lipschitz constant, just for any step length less than uh, tau over L squared. Um, then we've got that we're actually pointwise alpha firmly non-expansive, no violation, the epsilon is zero. So epsilon is zero there. Uh, and the alpha constant is one half. So firm non-expansiveness with no violation. Um, so that's good. And then, so now we can just put this all into, uh, I wanna you know, show you how then I apply this to, to, to this specific uh, setting here that we have, have in the paper. Um, so we're now looking at, let's look at this mapping T2, all right? I'm gonna write that as a steepest descent step. So the way I do that is so T2 is actually equal to the identity minus some scaling times a function R, where R is this function. Okay, great. Um, I'm just pretending that's, you know, that could be the gradient of some function or I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what really matters is that it, that it has, that it is, um, Let's see, so that, that we're Lipschitz here. This function is Lipschitz based on the assumptions that we uh, already had on the problem. And we're hypomonotone, this mapping R. So then we get from that, that this T2, the, the inner uh, fixed point mapping is almost alpha firmly non-expansive on some neighborhood of the fixed points with constant alpha one half and violation at most given by this. Um, uh, beta bar over 2L times, I'm not sure if it's, I think it should be like this. Um, and notice also that this violation can be made arbitrarily small by choosing beta bar small enough. Okay, as, as beta bar goes to zero, this, this thing goes to zero. Great. Um, but that's going to take smaller steps and maybe you don't want to do that. Uh, now let's look at uh, the first, um, the outer mapping. Um, this is fairly easy because this is this is pointwise alpha firmly non-expensive with constant one half violation at most epsilon one. Whenever this this uh, subdifferential of the f phi function is type one non-monotone, which I assumed uh, with constant epsilon one over two. So now I've got it. The only thing I need now I've got. So I've got alpha, almost alpha firm non-expansiveness of the individual pieces. Now I need a calculus that puts them together. And that's the last step here. So compositions of pointwise alpha firmly non-expansive mappings. And the, the tricky thing here is that I need to keep track of, since I've got compositions, the image of the inner uh, operators is the domain of the outer operators. So I just need to make sure that the image of the inner operator stays in the domain of the outer operator, where all of the nice good properties hold, and that and similar for the for the um, the fixed point set. The S is going to be kind of my the solution set that I'm that I'm after. Okay, uh, and and so uh, as long as as long as the regions kind of are nicely nested in this way then a composition of uh, pointwise, almost alpha firmly non-expansive mappings, the TMs, um, uh, right, I didn't, I missed the if with violation code, whenever, oh, okay. Well, I'm assuming that the TMs, uh, T1 through TM are almost alpha firmly non-expansive with violations epsilon J and constant, um, and constant one half. That's what I have in my previous thing. Uh, well, actually, no, no, any constant here works. That's that's the formulation I've got. Um, so then the violation, the way the violation works on the composition is through this formula. And the constants um, cooperate through this formula. Okay. Uh, and this uh, these very similar kinds of formulas show up in the in the convex analysis book of, of Heinz Bauschke and, and um, Patrick Combet, but of course they don't have this violation term because um, there is no violation. Um, so now you put this all together, you've got uh, this F phi, this is defined by this, proper lower semi-continuous 
subdifferentially regular with the subdifferential being type one non-monotone modulus epsilon over two, epsilon one over two. Um, and then under the other assumptions, I don't need to add those to, to my local analysis. Then we get that the SB palm operator is pointwise almost alpha firmly non-expansive with constant two thirds, uh, alpha two thirds and violation given by this. This was that violation that then when I went to the metric subregularity constant, the metric subregularity subregularity constant has to be kind of overwhelm this violation. And that's exactly where that upper bound on that is, is coming from. Um, and so that's, that's how you do it. Um, what else did I want to say? So this is right. That's where if we go down to the sufficient conditions here, the sufficiency that we saw. That's exactly where this condition is going. This is the violation uh, of the composite operator. Um, and as long as you get that, then you have this rate, which is less than one, so it's a contraction uh, relative to the fixed points uh, with the contraction constant in gamma. And, um, and that's, that's it. So um, uh, I hope that uh, was helpful to see <laughs> how all this, this works. Um, and like, like I said, uh, I, I make my students do these calculations uh, in, when they take my, my lecture on this stuff. And they all hate it, but uh, I hope at least you could see that, yeah, the, the calculations can get hairy, but it's, it's all really pretty straightforward. Okay, thank you, Russell. Very useful to Royal. Um, so any question for Russell? Any question or comment? Uh, Russell, um, I think um, your your framework about um, the almost no expensive almost almost firmly no expensive right can be applied to like many other algorithms right it's not yeah. not necessary the, the the SB pump so no. can can you give some some other overview on that. Yeah, so I have um, I have applied this. Uh, I have another. Um, I've applied this. To uh, cyclic projections. Uh, uh, for inconsistent non-convex feasibility. And that we did in the paper uh, with Matt and Tao. So, You can see how that works. Um, <clears throat> I did this for Douglas Ratchford, relaxed Douglas Ratchford. Uh, for inconsistent non-convex feasibility. <laughs> okay. And I think I've even presented this paper uh, last year in this forum. Yeah. The, um, the paper with Anna, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was with uh, yeah. Martins. And that's uh, 2020, I think. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, those are the, the main ones, because also in these also showed Metric subregularity. For certain geometries, for um, for um, you 
in particular, uh, we were looking at um, circles. So circles like this, circles that um, of course, maybe look like this. Um, and, and we could also, you can get the, the tangent case where you don't, uh, where things kind of break down. Uh, and there you can show that you do not have linear convergence, but you can, it's a sublinear type of convergence uh, for that. <clears throat> so we okay. show those, those things. Um, and then other papers, uh, I'm working on randomized algorithms. Well, actually, well, okay, random function iterations. Uh, and um, <clears throat> non uh, sort of and um, uh, um, prox gradient algorithms. Uh, in ca kappa spaces, um, oops. And that's been all of my recent work. So this is um, everything from 2019 uh, up to current. And I'm doing that with um, uh, Neil Hammer, was with the random function iterations and Anya Storm. Uh, and then Beda Lima, former student, and Lauster, current student. Um, <clears throat> so there, it, you don't have a gradient in a, in a general ca kappa space, um, but you have something like a gradient. Um, and so there, we work with prox operators. You can, you can do that. So, so your, your framework have a a wide range of, of um, applications, right? Yeah, but yeah. but you you said you also application you you can also apply to to get sublinear conversion. Yes, because yeah. it, okay, because so far I I only know that you you get a local linear conversion. You get you get sublinear convergence when um, let's see. Uh, let's see, do, 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 do I have that? Uh, when this mu is not a constant, but a gauge function. Ah, oh, okay, 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 that's it. Yeah. Yes, that makes sense. Oh, wait a minute, not, not there, sorry, not there, it's here. This is, this is the necessary condition. So yeah. this, this is the metric subregularity. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I would call this, I would call this, uh, gauge metric subregularity with gauge mu bar. Okay. Okay, so interesting. Uh, uh, any um, other question or comment for us? Though? There is um, there is thanks from Vera. To you. Thanks, Vera. <laughs> thanks, thanks to you all for for stay, staying for this. You're all uh, very uh, hardcore, um, and uh, so and uh, Alex, if you're still there, um, uh -huh. sorry, sorry that I um, I gave you more work. Uh, you 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 know what I'm. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Aristanelides uh, was in touch with you a few days ago. Um, but uh, I, I, I couldn't think of anybody else on planet Earth who was better suited to very critically look at that paper. And I think that needs a very, a very critical look. I, I don't think I received anything from you in recent days. Not, not from me, but from Aris Danalides. Ah, OK. You, know what you are about? taking me together. I, I I was the I was the reason why Aris con 